Okay, so the next challenge that was presented to Dr. Laura to explain the next biblical uh, statement was about slaves. It says in Leviticus 25.44, states that I may indeed possess slaves, both male and female, provided they're purchased from neighboring nations. A friend of mine claims that this applies to Mexicans but not Canadians. So can you clarify, why can't I own Canadians? Okay, so what it's saying is that it indeed says in the Torah that slave ownership is permissible. You can buy a slave, but it has to be from the nations around you, the neighboring nations. And so he's saying, so that means you can't buy an American, you can buy Mexicans and Canadians. Whereas his friend says, no, you can't have a Canadian. Why not? So what's underlying in this attack on the Torah is the fact that the Torah being a source of morality allows slavery. That whatever we say, and even though last, one of the, one of the previous uh, questions dealing with slavery, we mentioned all the laws of how a slave has to be treated, but the, t- the Torah does differentiate between owning a non-Jewish slave or a Jewish slave. Oh, really? Yes. And when it says here about the neighboring nations, it means that the nations around you, as opposed to a Jewish slave, you cannot own a Jewish slave. And we discussed last week that, 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 a, that a, a Jewish slave is only for six years and then goes free, whereas a non-Jewish slave is yours to keep and uh, can be purchased, bought, and owned. Why? So the Torah says, because Jews are my slaves, says God. That, that I, they belong to me, they're my servants, my slaves, so therefore they can't belong to anybody else. Uh, so you cannot purchase an, a Jew as a slave, or as a non-Jew, you can purchase as a slave. And so the underlying attack here is not whether it's Canadians or Mexicans, but the very idea of owning a slave is something so archaic so immoral, something that today we recognize as being completely wrong. And anyone in any enlightened community and society sees slavery as being uh, uh, an extremely unholy, immoral thing. And yet the Torah does allow it. So, so how, can we, how can we explain this? Well, first of all, just to make it clear, even where it does say you can own a slave, the laws and the restrictions of how you treat the slave still do apply. Uh, Maimonides, Rambam, in, in Laws of Slavery, he has the laws there, and he talks about how a Jewish slave owner should treat his non-Jewish slaves. And he says that the way of the pious and the wise is that a person should be merciful and seek fairness, should not bear heavily on a servant and not cause him any pain. The servant should be fed every food and drink that the owner eats. As our sages would give their slaves food, whatever they would eat, they would give the slave, and every dish they would eat, they they would share with their slaves. Also, they would also feed them before they ate their own food. They would feed their slaves first, and then they would eat their meals. This is a non-Jewish slave. And so Maimonides continues that one should not belittle the slave in any way, or degrade them through violence or harsh speaking. You can't speak to them harshly. Um, They're there to serve you, but not to be degraded. Um, so that you shouldn't shout at them, says Maimonides, but get angry at them, rather speak gently. And you have to also listen to their complaints. That a slave owner has to listen to the complaints of a slave and, and address their grievances. So have to be treated like, 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 a, like a mensch. So if this is the case, why didn't the Torah just abolish slavery altogether? Why didn't the Torah just make an outright rule? There is no such thing as, as slavery. It took... Because it's a commodity at, at that time, I suppose. It would have been treated as a possession. Okay, that's true. But if it's but if there's something innately immoral and wrong mm. about slavery, mm. so the Torah should forbid it, just like it forbids all other immorality. Why? Yeah, why is it allowed in the first again, place? But again, aren't you putting some people in a better position than they were before? Like you put, if you sold your daughter into slavery, you're giving her a better life. Aren't some people that are slaves mm-hmm. actually elevated from the position that they were in potentially as non-slaves? Definitely true. Definitely true. But. Couldn't we call it something else then? No, don't call it slavery. Call it a working. Uh, but they paid off. Maid. They were paying off, like for instance, the debt. They had no other way to pay it off. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So in that case, yeah. we're giving them that option where there, there was no other option for them. Correct. But that's a Jewish slave. Here, a non-Jewish slave is just being bought as a slave in the slave market. Maybe they would want. Why allow some? such a thing? It's inhumane. It's wrong. Immoral. So an interesting answer to this is that the Torah had something in mind here. When, when God gave us these rules of how to treat a slave, the ultimate goal was to abolish slavery. But it couldn't be done in one go. 
Rambam, Maimonides, in his great work, Murin Avuch, in the Guide to the Perplexed, he says a principle that God does not ever try to change human nature unilaterally. God does not impose a change on us. God gives us commands that we, by obeying them, will change ourselves. And so while God interferes in nature, He'll never interfere in human nature. He will not try to change people in one go. And so therefore, the laws of the Torah have in mind the human reality, the, the, the reality on the ground. So, here as well, you, utilizing that principle in, in this case, slavery in the ancient world was the basis of the economy, was the, ba the basis of everything. That was just the way of life. What, what we today call a worker, they called a slave, and that was, that was the way things worked. If the Torah would have come and abolished slavery, so it would have turned everything upside down. It wasn't something that people could have coped with. You can't just overnight change the reality. Things take time to change. My mom says that's why it took us 40 years in the desert before we reached the land of Israel. Because we had to get out of our Egyptian mentality in order to live as free people in the land of Israel. It took a whole generation to, to change from slavery to freedom. So too, there's a, there's a big picture the Torah has about changing our attitudes to things. That if, if, if the Torah would have simply forbidden slavery, you can't have it, then, then it would not have worked. There would have been a rebellion. It would not have practically been possible. So instead of doing it that way, what the Torah did is put into motion a system that will eventually naturally make slavery abolish itself. And what was that? By making it clear that a slave is a human being, is a fellow human being that needs to be treated like a human being. By putting laws down that tell you the way you have to treat a slave, it changed the entire mentality of what a slave is. In the ancient world, a slave was seen as a piece of property that, that belonged to you, and a person who was a slave was seen as, a, as innately a slave. It wasn't, that, uh, it wasn't a career Stop choice. Human. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was that they were a different species. One example, Aristotle, who was the greatest Greek thinker and philosopher, a very sophisticated <laughs> thinker, he describes the slave as being having the soul of a slave. He said somebody who is just naturally a subjugated being. There are some people who are born to be owners, and others are born to be owned. And Aristotle understood there are slave souls and there are free souls. Some people are born free, others are born as slaves. That is their caste. That is their their nature, like like, like, a, like a completely different uh, race. Almost. That's how, in the ancient world, slaves were looked at. Came along the Torah and said, no, a slave is a human being as well. Their circumstances have led them into slavery, but they have to be treated like a human being. And so by not, not abolishing the concept of slavery, but abolishing the attitude of slavery, that's what the Torah did. It told us that, that you can't treat them as a subhuman or as somebody who's destined to be a slave for, forever because they were born that way. You have to treat them as an equal who is in a different circumstance to you. They have to be treated with respect and dignity. They cannot be belittled and, and degraded. And they have to be fed and treated like a mensch. By doing that, it's only then a matter of time before the concept of slavery itself is just going to be irrelevant anymore. Because, because the, the very the, the ancient mindset of a slave being a, a, a group of people who are there to be owned, it's just, it's just gone. So the carpet was taken from under slavery through the Torah. And therefore, in time, it just became a natural thing. And therefore, the abolishment of slavery, you can say, it was, a, it was actually a biblical achievement. It was biblical morality, and the countries and nations that took on biblical morality, they ended up abolishing slavery. We're going to start being nice at a Vinny. <laughs> Are there any other like, concepts like that, where, in the Torah, where they've actually... Well, it's interesting. The, the one that Maimonides brings as an example is a very controversial one sacrifices. Maimonides in, in, he mm. brings this idea in, in, when he talks Stop about sacrifices and he says that why does the Torah command us to bring sacrifices? Only because that's we what people were used to. We, we were in Egypt and in pagan cultures. We were used to sacrifices as being the way to serve God. And so if, if God would have told us, I don't want sacrifices, I just want you to daven, so we would have uh, not been able to adjust to that. So he said, okay, bring sacrifices. But Maimonides implies as if it's a, it's like a temporary right. thing yeah. until we get over that and become different. Because that's one thing the missionaries use against us a lot. 
that we've got no way to atone for sin. Because the Torah says this is the way to atone for sin. You haven't got a Besa Mikdash now. Sure. You can't give an offering. Right. You've got sin. Correct. The simple ex- answer to that is... Sure. Yeah, we have sin. That, that, well, <laughs> uh, that, that the sacrifice is only atoned for accidental sin, unintentional sins, not intentional sins. If you weren't sinned intentionally, you couldn't bring a sacrifice. That wasn't good enough. So how do you get rid of the accidental sins now? So even there, it says that, uh, that our lips replace the bullocks of sacrifice. And so through prayer, you know... And even then, a sacrifice on, on its own did nothing. It had to come with contrite heart and regret and a real feeling. See, I always thought that it, it's not necessarily realistic to think that you're going to be without sin. Everyone has sin. Right, but you need to be forgiven for the sin. You don't want to carry that sin with you. So we have a, a process called tshuva. You know, to, to say that somebody else suffering can help my sin, mm. no, you have to actually change yourself and do something about it. So, so interestingly, even though Maimonides, he, he, what, he, what he uses that principle for is quite a controversial one, sacrifice. Because even Maimonides himself writes in his Mishnah Torah, in his book of Halakha, that in the third temple there will be sacrifices. There will be sacrifices again. It will return. I mean, in our prayers we all pray for sacrifice. So, it's not to say sacrifice was a temporary thing, but the principle is interesting that Torah takes into account time. And so therefore, it put into motion a process that will eventually obliterate slavery on its own.